In May 2021, in the aftermath of Israel's 11-day bombardment of Gaza that killed 250 Palestinians, the UN Independent International Commission of Inquiry on the Occupied Palestinian Territory and Israel was established. Its mandate to investigate all alleged violations of international humanitarian law establish the underlying causes of recurrent tensions, document and verify the evidence and identify those responsible. The woman leading the inquiry is former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pillay. Weeks before Hamas carried out its October the 7th surprise offensive in southern Israel and Israel launched a major military operation in Gaza, Pillay released a report. It says, the Commission finds the increasingly militarized law enforcement operations of Israel and repeated attacks by Israel on Gaza are aimed at maintaining its unlawful 56-year occupation. With the latest escalation now in its third week, Nave Pillay talks to Al Jazeera. Nave Pillay, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Let's just start at the beginning about what your commission is. You are a distinguished judge, but this isn't a court. This is an investigating uh, mechanism. My understanding it was, is it was set up in uh, 2021, immediately after the fourth Gaza war. I assume the Human Rights Council, who set this up, wanted to avoid another Gaza war. And yet, we now have a fifth Gaza war, which is bloodier than any of the conflicts in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity, James. Thank you for your program. Um, this is a, uh, it's obviously not a court of law, but all commissions do follow some of the precepts of a judicial inquiry, and that is respecting independence, impartiality, carefully weighing the evidence, so it's much uh, more secure than, uh, you know, press statements issued uh, by institutions and so on. So that's the beauty of a commission of inquiry. They do investigate, they produce reports, they make recommendations, which is what we have done. Now, in this particular commission has a very wide mandate. Firstly, it's not time bound. It's almost permanent. And that's one of the reasons why some states, including the United States and Europe, did not support the establishment of this commission, that it doesn't have an end date, to which I have said, well, the occupation doesn't have an end date either, and you tend to support that occupation. Um, the other aspects of the mandate are that we have an investigative mandate. We can uh, identify suspects, key perpetrators, work with judicial institutions, such as the International Court of Justice. And, uh, as I said already, to make recommendations, uh, to look into um, the root causes of the conflict. That's a very important mandate that has not been done before. Above all, we have a territorial jurisdiction that does not apply to any other commission, and that is we have jurisdiction over in, inside Israel, Palestine, the West Bank, and Gaza. So that's a, a wide jurisdiction. And that's why we can cover new and emerging issues such as the events that are happening now. Yes, I, I agree with you that clearly uh, Palestine that moved for this commission had in mind that once and for all they could attend to crucial questions such as the observance of international law, the end of the occupation, and other matters that are crucial to end the conflict, to achieve peace in, in the Middle East. And I imagine that that's why they, they wanted this commission of inquiry. And you're quite right, then it, we were all taken completely unawares by this attack that was committed by Hamas. Now, your latest report doesn't cover the events after uh, uh, October the 7th, uh, but um, you obviously have uh, um, uh, an inquiry 
um, your, your investigation can look at those in future reports. Let me ask you about those. Uh, what Hamas did first on, on that date, are those war crimes? Yeah, firstly, say, uh, let me say our current report was actually completed in August. These are the UN rules. It was filed here. But immediately after October 7th, when the, uh, this attack occurred, uh, and Hamas has admitted their responsibility, that's why we acknowledge them as the responsible party. Uh, we, because of our extended mandate, immediately dropped our own planned program of work and jumped into investigating this. Uh, by the third day, we issued a press statement condemning this attack because it harmed civilians and violated international law. And we called for submissions. We immediately started collecting, gathering evidence to fulfill our mandate of achieving justice and accountability, working with justice institutions such as the International Criminal Court. From the evidence that we gathered, it's clear to us that war crimes are being committed. And now, with the uh, Israeli action or reaction to the Hamas attack, we really find from the facts that war crimes are being committed, have been committed by Hamas, are being committed by Israel. And that's because of the indiscriminate attack and the killings and injuries to civilians, including children. Obviously, since then, we've seen a massive bombardment by Israel. Do you, in your view, consider this as legitimate self-defence or is this collective punishment and, in fact, brutal revenge? From the evidence we've already gathered, we are concluding that this is indiscriminate attacks against civilians, very excessive, and does not conform with the requisites of international law, which is disproportionality and with the focus on protection of civilians. And therefore, we thought this cannot uh, be equated with self-defense. It amounts to collective punishment. And we know the facts of those who are dying. Over half of those who die are women and children so far? I've heard the statistic, that, uh, you know, we, we're not sure of any of this. We, inter we will establish these statistics later. But without verification, I'm horrified at the figure of just two of the children who have been killed. How can children ever be deemed to be a, a threat so much so that Israel has to defend itself against these babies and children? On the sixth day of the war, Israel itself, they said they dropped 6,000 bombs. That's the same number used by the US in their battle against ISIL in Raqqa. And in six days, they used more bombs than the US used in Afghanistan in a single year. What do you make of that? I think this should shock all of us into rapid reaction. I'm right here at the UN as I speak to you, James, and I'm appalled at the lack of uh, quick decisions in the deliberations that are going on in the Security Council and the General Assembly. These are the facts that, they sh that should be before them to immediately demand what we have already called for in our press statement, which is a cessation of hostilities not just a humanitarian pause. I think I believe that's a subject matter of the discussion, but a ceasefire. And why we call for that is because civilians are at risk. International uh, inter humanitarian law and the uh, Geneva Conventions are being violated very seriously in front of our eyes. Well, let me ask you about that some of the other things. Let me, let me, let, let me ask you about some entry. of the other things that Israel yeah. has done and whether you think these are violations of international law. They've cut off the water and the electricity. They've only allowed limited aid supplies in and they're not allowing fuel in. Now, fuel is needed, as you know, to pump the water and for desalination of the water, but also for the hospitals. Uh, the uh, dialysis machines, ventilators, they may all have to be shut off. And there's also a very disturbing report that perhaps incubators, which are keeping more than 100 uh, new babies alive, may also have to be shut off. Are these war crimes? 
These are war crimes. They are clear violations of international law. And here, let me take my cap off as the chair of the, this commission and to speak as my lengthy judicial experience, both on the Rwanda, the United Nations Tribunal for Rwanda, and the International Criminal Court. So I know the way judges weigh the evidence that these facts will clearly amount to very serious war crimes. They have to stop immediately. The other thing that Israel has done is ordered people in Gaza City and the north to move to the south of the Gaza Strip. Initially, they gave people only 24 hours. And as you know, that population includes elderly people, people with children, people who are in hospital who cannot move. That sort of order, that sort of instruction from Israel, does that count as forced deportation in your view? We've already thought so. We're looking at that. You know, we reported uh, uh, these forced deportations, forced removal, dislocation of uh, Palestinians in our report that we had completed in August. And now we see the situation much worse when people in the north of Gaza are being ordered to move out of there. I mean, to move where? Nobody wants to receive them. But the worst situation is uh, we've already heard from some families that when they moved from the north to the south of Gaza, they were bombed. One person said his entire family has been killed. Uh, so with uh, great anxiety, we've now uh, adopted an attitude of expediting our investigation as fast as we can. And these latest events, as I said, they're not in this current report. Uh, but the current report shows the events of the last year before what we've seen in the last few weeks. And one of the things that's in this current report uh, is the killing of our Al Jazeera colleague, Shireen Abu Akleh. Now, I always try and be impartial, but it's very, very hard on this occasion because she was our colleague and I worked uh, with Shireen. But let me ask you about that day that she died. Early in the morning, there was an Israeli military raid in Janine, a pre-dawn raid, and along with other reporters uh, from Al Jazeera and other media, she went to go and cover what was clearly a newsworthy event. You've looked into this closely. What happened then? Our investigation and our conclusions that we incorporated in our report and delivered to the General Assembly is now, in fact, a United Nations investigation. So, firstly, that's the beauty of the mandate. They didn't have to create a new mechanism to investigate this. We have done so. Well, even with limited resources, we were able to um, engage in a forensic examination. We identified the Israeli Defense Force military unit. It's the Dov Devon uh, unit, and we know the commander of that unit. We have his name. We haven't disclosed the name as yet, but we will to a judicial institution. And so we found that that was uh, a direct intentional killing of uh, Shireen with her, and she's been deprived of her right to life. If her killing is not investigated, and if, if, not, if there's no apology and compensation, that at least there must be justice and the perpetrators must be brought to account. Now, Shireen was with other press. They were clearly, were they not, um, identifiable as members of the press. Also, I understand Shireen was shot in the head. They clearly intended to kill her. The, as a commission, we ourselves held oral hearings in Geneva, and the journalist who accompanied Shireen, and, and he took a bullet in his arm, I think, he gave evidence before us. So we already have his evidence that there, Shireen was there to report on violations as she saw them in Janine. So she was there for a true journalistic uh, reason. And I think we, the public, are appalled when a journalist is attacked because that journalist was doing a service for us, the public. She was at great risk. She was reporting on events so that we will be informed. And that's why this her, her killing is causing so much grief, not only to the family, but to the media world and to all of us.
What do you make of what the, Isra uh, what the Israelis said about this? Immediately after the killing, they said it was Palestinian terrorists firing indiscriminately, and then they came out with a preliminary investigation where they said it was um, hundreds of bullets from Palestinian gunmen and possibly an exchange of fire between Palestinian gunmen and Israeli security forces. And then when they came up with their final report in September last year, a high possibility uh, that she was accidentally hit by security forces gunfire. Their, their explanations have changed repeatedly. Which points clearly to how to the untruths that we are being presented with, it makes us suspicious. It makes us so suspicious that we find it hard to have any confidence in any explanations that Israel gives. And what makes it particularly suspicious is why won't they allow an investigation? They've blocked the FBI investigation, but we have again and again asked to, to be able to enter Israel not only to investigate this killing of Shireen, but to hear from Israeli victims. They have a right to tell of their experiences, their suffering, and particularly these uh, recent events, victims of these attacks, civilian Israelis who were injured, whose family members were killed, they have a right to speak to us as well. So therefore, this is what I said at the General Assembly, saying to the Israeli ambassador who was present, let us in. If you have nothing to hide, why not let us in so we could conduct impartial investigations? I'm satisfied with where we got with the limited resources. There's a lot to answer for. I should think that it's ready to be considered by a prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. So, you know, the truth can't be hidden for long. You identify the commando unit, the Du Devan, uh, apparently also known as Unit 217, uh, being responsible. Um, I've been reading about them. They apparently carry mm -hmm. out high-risk and complex operations, including targeted killings of militants. But they seem to have, on this occasion, uh, it's a targeted killing of a journalist. Uh, is it just the soldier who fired that round who is legally responsible, or does this go up the chain of command? You no, know, international law um, w under the Rome Statute provides for command responsibility. That's why we zeroed in on uh, establishing the name of the commander. We don't know the name of the soldier who actually fired the bullet, but we haven't stopped our investigations. We'll, we'll be pursuing it. It's important that we know the name of the commander, but he, because he probably g issued the order on which the soldier who did the sh actual shooting uh, acted. He followed orders. You have said that you're not allowed to go uh, into Israel or the Palestinian territories. They've not given you permission to go there. Not only that, though, um, you've had lots of criticism of your commission of inquiry from the US, who says you're biased, but Israel's gone even further. They say that your commission of inquiry is anti-Semitic. What do you make of those allegations? Let me first say, James, you know, I was a high commissioner for... For, it's a four-year term. I, were, I was the only one who, whose term was extended to six years. Yeah, well, Israel voted in support of the extension of my term. I'm the only high commissioner who was invited to conduct a mission inside Israel. I mean, nobody criticized me for bias or, or of being an anti-Semitic. These kind of uh, what I call abuse are being hurled since I undertook this responsibility of chairing the Commission of Inquiry. I will continue my work in, uh, in the manner in which I have been accustomed to. We have our own standards uh, together with the other commissioners. So we will continue. The abuse does not deter us. Uh, on the other hand, I could see that all these actions are really to distract attention from the content of the report. I would like them to look at the substance of our report and see where we've gone wrong in terms of the facts we've gathered and the law as we've interpreted it. So I'm very happy that our recommendations have been adopted by the General Assembly and the 
question of the lawfulness of the occupation and the responsibility of, per of parties, state members who support an unlawful occupation are spelt out by the International Court of Justice. I do see that that will advance the peace process and not uh, obstruct the peace process, as our detractors claim. You're not the only person who's come under attack by Israel. In recent days, Israel has been attacking a man you know very well, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres. He said in the Security Council yes. the attack by Hamas did not happen in a vacuum. Israel responded by blocking UN officials, including the humanitarian chief, Martin Griffiths, from visiting, and has called on the Secretary General to resign. Do you see similarities in the attacks on the UN now and the attacks on your Commission of Inquiry? I think the attacks on our Commission of Inquiry are mild. I'm, uh, I'm, I find that it's remarkable how much the, um, the critics from Israel have mounted the attacks on the Secretary General himself. This has never happened before, asking the Secretary General to resign when he has made a legitimate statement. One country member should not be allowed to make statements such as this or to call for the uh, withdrawal of the Secretary General. I understand that the Foreign Minister has since watered down his statement. It should never have been made in the first place. The Secretary General made a legitimate statement, in my view, and actually we are the ones who provided the evidence of what's been going on in the past years, which sets the uh, factual background to why the Secretary General is quite right in saying that this attack is not uh, ju just something that arose in isolation, but that we must look at the context. We must look at how desperate Palestinians are for some end to the conflict and the uh, oppression under which they have to live daily. You talk about the context. In your report, you refer to the broader context of the Israeli occupation, which Israel has no intention of ending. With your background in South Africa, as the first non-white female High Court judge in South Africa, do you think this is an apartheid regime? Yes, I, I think it is. I know that we've been asked to address it as uh, address the issue of, of apartheid. Now, in the Commission, we're still getting there because we think the root cause is the occupation itself. Apartheid is one of the uh, acts of discrimination that are regularly practiced there. And let me say, James, as a South African who born under apartheid and in the struggle, uh, we, we were very desperate to have some kind of relief, you know. At the time, I never thought we'll see change in our lives. And it was at that time, as President Mandela later explained to us, that at some point he had to very reluctantly resort to the principle of embarking on an armed struggle. Of course, admittedly, they didn't uh, go and kill a whole lot of white people or civilians. They went for uh, strategic uh, um, structures, such as a, a, a light pole or a oil storage, these kind of things. But the point I'm making is when you're back when you have a whole population oppressed for so long with no remedies, no relief, they are actually forced to resort to armed struggle. However, as a judge, we do condemn indiscriminate attacks on civilians. When you say that you don't think Israel wants the occupation to end, you know the position of the international community, and you hear it every time there's a Security Council meeting from all of the main players, is there needs to be a two-state solution. But you seem to be hinting at something that none of them are pre prepared to say. The current Israeli government doesn't want a two-state solution. You know, James, what we see are facts on the ground. Yeah, there's hardly any territory left. There's been forcible dislocation of Palestinians, um, an increase of settlements, even against Security Council resolutions. 
the moving in of outsiders, all of which goes against the rules of occupation, actually, if there are any rules uh, to this. And this is why we think that this occupation uh, has continued for so long that Israel does not have any intention of ending it. And the possibilities of a two-state solution are remote directly as a result of their actions. And I'm really surprised that many states, particularly in Europe, think that the status quo should just continue as is, but to what end? And this is why I am proud to serve on this commission, which majority of member states have adopted in order to address the root causes of the conflict and seek remedies. Nave Pillay, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you very much, James.